we should be in the mode of self-reflection in order to better ourselves and bring ourselves more closely in line with what God wants us to be. The church of self-love just throws all that out, and you are the center of the universe. You get to make your own decisions about what is right is what is wrong, and you get to speak your truth and just be authentic to yourself. See, Jesus says the opposite. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. Ellen Page, you may remember her from movies like X-Men Days of Future Past, which is probably my favorite role that she's been in. She's in Inception, she's in Juno. I didn't see Juno, but you know, uh, it's interesting because I've heard it's actually really good and I've just never watched it, but uh, been, been in a lot of stuff. Apparently she is sold out because I don't know if you realize this, but Ellen Page was a lesbian. She's not now, but she was a lesbian, so she was a woman that liked women. Apparently that is no longer the case. Apparently now Ellen Page has completely sold out and she is now trans and referring to herself as Elliot Page. But she's a guy, presumably, if we're, if we're going by her logic, follow the math with me on this one and let's go down this, this journey. <laughs> she's apparently a guy, but still likes women. And if you're a guy that likes women, and she's white, so wouldn't that make her a straight white man? So I'd just like to say to Ellen Page, welcome to the patriarchy. I mean, I appreciate you selling out your lesbian brethren to become a straight white man. So, yeah, welcome to the club. I appreciate it. I welcome Elliot Page to our side of this. I, you know, I think the lesbians are going to be pretty mad at her for selling out and, and becoming part of the patriarchy. But that seems to be the, the one that is, is she now like the lesbian equivalent of an Uncle Tom? Has she, <laughs> she sold out on that? <laughs> You know, when, uh, a couple of years ago, when the, the trans were trying to get into the gay pride movement and the gay pride parade there in London, and you had a bunch of angry lesbians that were counter-protesting the trans people, which, I mean, was hilarious on a number of levels. But when you had the lesbians actually going out and protesting the trans people saying trans erase lesbians, which, by the way, according to their own logic, actually does make sense, because you can't be a lesbian, a woman that likes women, if women aren't a thing, if you don't believe women exist and it's all subjective and you can change at any time, then you can't be like, well, I'm a woman that only likes women because that doesn't mesh. See, this is the problem when you abandon reason for madness, when you engage in a worldview that is based on feelings rather than facts, because everything's up in the air and it's all situational. And because of that, nothing makes sense. So let's go ahead and read her official statement that she issued on Instagram. We won't read the whole thing, but we're going to read some significant portions of it because quite frankly it just entertains me so let's go ahead and look at the first little segment of this this is her introduction where she says hi friends i wanted to share with you that i am trans my pronouns are he they okay shouldn't that be he him i i, I don't know i don't understand I, i'm only conversational and bullcrap i'm not fluent and my name is elliot i feel lucky to be writing this to be here to have arrived at this place in my life. So that on its head is, is pretty interesting. I find it interesting that she chose a gender neutral name because I've actually met girls named Elliot. It's rare, but that is a name that can be used for a man or a woman. Maybe Ellen decides that she changes her mind. And even though she's Elliot now, she's girl Elliot for the day. And then later she I don't know, has something for lunch and decides, oh, I feel like a man. Eating that steak sandwich really made me feel manly. So now I'm a man for the rest of the day. I guess if that's the case, then picking a gender neutral name like Elliot would work. Maybe that's the plan. I don't know. Again, I only kind of understand the bullcrap because I'm here every day. But I do find that interesting. And maybe hasn't she hasn't like totally fully committed to it. And that's the reason that she went with the gender obscure name, I guess is the correct way to say it. I also ask for patience. My joy is real, but it is also fragile. 
The truth is, despite feeling profoundly happy right now and knowing how much privilege I carry, I am also scared. I'm scared of the invasiveness and the hate and the jokes and of violence. To be clear, I am not trying to dampen the moment that is joyous and one that I celebrate. Oh, but I bet you're going to try real hard. Uh, but I want to address the full picture. The statistics are staggering. The discrimination towards trans people is rife, insidious, and cruel, resulting in horrific consequences. In 2020 alone, it has been reported that at least 40 transgender people have been murdered, the majority of which were black and Latinx, trans women. Okay, I think I understand that sentence, but I'm not sure, so we're just going to move on. To the political leaders who work to criminalize trans health and deny our rights to exist and all of those with a massive platform who continue to spew hostility towards the trans community. Oh, good, she's talking about me now. You have the blood on your hands. Unleash a, you unleash a fury of vile and demeaning rage that lands on the shoulders of the trans community, a community in which 40% of trans adults report attempting suicide. Mm -hmm. Enough is enough. You, are, you aren't being canceled, you are hurting people. I am one of those people, and we will not be silent in the face of your attacks. All right, so there's a lot to digest here, but I'm going to give you the long and short of it. So first of all, the stats do not tell the story that she claims. Because in the, the thing about the 40 trans people being murdered, remember that we live in a country of 328 million people. 40 is not a big number. Now, granted, the trans community is a significantly smaller portion of that. In fact, it's, it's not even one whole percent. It's a very, very tiny fraction of the American populace considers themselves trans. And I don't know how significant a portion of that would be 40, but 40 people in a country that size, that's very, very small. I mean, you could pick literally any demographic or special interest group or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it could be something as objective as black people or as abstract as, I don't know, something ideological, just NRA members or something like that. And I guarantee you, you would probably find more than 40 people there. Now, maybe as a percentage, it's, it's large. I really don't know because I don't have the stats in front of me. But 40 people is not like an earth-shattering number in a country this size. And the other thing that she kind of leaves out of that is that a lot of the people that she was just talking about in that 40 group, those murders are, of course, horrible, and I would never condone any kind of violence against anybody for something like that. I mean, unless you're acting in self-defense, violence is just never acceptable. Obviously, I would condemn anybody that would do something like that. However, a lot of the time, and this doesn't justify it, I'm just telling you the truth, a lot of the times what we found with these murders of trans people is it was a prostitute. Prostitution is very big in the trans community. A much higher percentage of trans people engage in illegal prostitution than people that are outside that community. But a lot of times what happens is that it's somebody that tells someone they are one gender and then they get in the bedroom and get ready to do their business and it's somebody else. Now, does that justify killing someone? Absolutely not. But what I am saying here is, is they act as though the, what they're trying to drum up in your head is this mental image and a narrative that there are random people like me, evangelical white cisgender males that are just going out and killing trans people for no reason other than the fact that they happen to be trans. That's the narrative they want you to craft in your head when they give you a statistic like this. But the simple fact of the matter is, normally, when this happens, it is people that are involved in some kind of prostitution or drug deal. They're engaged in a crime already, and because of the lifestyle choices they made, they wind up being murdered. This actually happened in the state of Alabama, you may remember, uh, a little over a year ago, if I'm not mistaken. There was a big deal made about a trans person being murdered but they were never able to figure out whether or not it was actually because the person was trans or the other person even knew whether that person was trans or not. And that's another thing, too. This also leaves out, what if the person was just randomly murdered? 
had nothing to do with they were trans. The other person may not have even known that they were trans and they wound up being murdered. Now, that's still a horrible thing, but it also doesn't tell the story that Ellen Page is trying to craft for you that these people are specifically being targeted for no reason other than them being trans. Again, if you took any other random demographic in the country and measured how often they were being measured, that in and of itself is not proof of some kind of systematic execution of these people going on. You know, they're there are thousands and thousands of white people that are murdered, far more than the 40 she's talking about. Does that mean that there is some kind of genocide going on against white people? No. And so she acts as, she acts as though this fact solidifies her argument, but provides no detail surrounding it specifically to try to make it seem a lot worse than it actually is. If somebody did kill someone merely because they are trans, that's, of course, a horrible thing to do. But this stat doesn't speak to that whatsoever. And then she goes on and talks about the 40% of trans people that have attempted suicide, which, again, of course, is horrible, and I do not condone that, but that's trans people doing that to themselves. And they will say, well, yes, they are doing it to themselves, but it's because other people are, be are bullying them and it's because of the rampant discrimination. See, here's the thing, though. You would think that that statistic of how many trans people have tried to commit suicide would go down in a country that is more accepting of that, right? That would stand to reason that if you're looking at maybe your Scandinavian countries or you're looking at some of your European countries that are more evolved than us, on this issue and tend to have less of a stigma that goes with it than more altruistic countries when it comes to trans people and trans rights and all this other stuff. Well, those would be the countries where the suicide rate goes down, right? Actually, no, it's almost identical. And so even in a country where this kind of bullying just doesn't go on, or at least not nearly to the levels that it does in the United States, the rate of this doesn't drop. By the way, it also doesn't drop post-operation. So if they go in and they have the sex change operation, the rate of suicide remains the same even post-operation. And so all of the narratives that they try to throw at you with this, they're not true. They simply are not based in reality. But again, just like Ellen Page is demonstrating here, when you live in a world that is dictated by your feelings, reality is really little more than just an inconvenience. And that's the reason that they can throw this out there and think that that makes them right, because they feel it really strongly. Ergo, they must be correct. The second part of that is, even if all of this were true, even if every word of what she was saying were true, that narrative that she was crafting, that there are people that are going out and killing trans people just because they're trans, even if that were correct... It would still be the fault of the murderer, not the people that are saying things that she doesn't like about trans people. You remember when a Bernie Sanders supporter, someone that actually worked for his campaign, so not just a Bernie voter, not just somebody that really liked Bernie Sanders, someone that literally worked for Bernie Sanders' campaign tried to murder a tenth of Congress, specifically Republicans, asked the guard on his way in there, before he knew who the guy was, hey, are those Republicans or, or Democrats playing on that softball field? Oh, it's Republicans. Okay, let me grab my guns and murder all of them. That's what happened there. Did I blame Bernie Sanders? No. Did any prominent conservative blame Bernie Sanders for that? No. Because unless Bernie Sanders actually called for violence, it's not Bernie Sanders' fault. You know, is a Bernie Sanders person maybe more prone to that? I don't know, maybe. It certainly seems like they're certainly more prone to it than people on the right. There have been more people that were friendlier to Bernie Sanders' cause that have engaged in crazy behavior like that, but it doesn't matter, it's still not Bernie Sanders' fault. And so this is a standard that I maintain, whether it's somebody on the right or somebody on the left. And I do not understand how somebody like Ellen or Elliot Page, whatever they want to be called now, I do not understand how they can seriously say that this is, comes from that idea that, well, I feel really bad about that language and I feel as though you shouldn't say that, ergo I'm going to try to justify 
regulating you out of saying that, that you shouldn't be allowed to say that. And that's how she's saying that speech is literally violence. No, just like the, mo just like the motto of the show says, speech isn't violence. And so she tries to make that case, but there's just no truth to it. And, and then third and finally, even if both of those things were true, even if you had a situation to where uh, they, they actually were responsible, the people that are saying things that she doesn't like about transgender people, that those people were responsible for the actions of other people unconnected to them that murder trans people, even if that were the case, which of course it's not, her next statement would still be false, which is, you're not being canceled, you're hurting people. Okay, those two things are not mutually exclusive. Let's, let's take a quick crash course in logic here. Whether you like them or not, whether you think that them being canceled is good or not, they are being canceled. If you have a show one day, you say something that people don't like, there's a big outrage and you get fired from your job, that is being canceled. Now, even if you think it was justified, even if you think the guy should lose his job, I of course don't, but even if you are of that belief, you can't say it's not being canceled. So again, words have meanings, but if you're living in a moral and logical vacuum, you will not find morality or logic. That's just how this works. But what this segment of her statement here does prove is that I don't know if she genuinely believes this about herself or not, that she genuinely believes that she is a man or isn't. I don't know, because I'm not inside Ellen Page's head. But I do know that at least partially the motive of this had nothing to do with being true to herself or whatever other gobbledygook she wants to throw out there. It was a, it was a cudgel to bludgeon her political opponents with. Because that's what she really wanted, right? What she really wanted to do was not to remain true to herself or to speak her truth or however else the media, uh, the media wants to spin this in her favor. Ultimately, what this was is I don't like conservatives and want to bludgeon them over the head, and this is an effective way to do it in her mind. To say that now I'm part of this community, and so I'm going to speak out about this. That's her rationale. She states it right there. She's not hiding the ball here. It's very, it's very obvious what is happening here. And then this, ultimately, the virtue signal is what she wanted out of it. Ultimately, that is what she wanted. That, that's, her, which, I mean, to her credit, I guess that is being true to herself because that's what she really wanted. So in that sense, that's why she launches off into this moral tirade when doing what presumably should have just been about her being uh, authentic or whatever and revealing her identity to everybody else. She launches off in an attack against people she doesn't like because the truth is that's her real motive. That's what she wants more than anything else. And then this is kind of exemplified in this final piece of this particular statement by Ellen or Elliot Page. I love that I am trans. I love that, I, and I love that I am queer. And the more I hold myself close and fully embrace who I am, the more I dream, the more my heart grows, and the more I thrive. To all trans people who deal with harassment, self-loathing, abuse, and the threat of violence every day, I see you, I love you, and I will do everything I can to change this world for the better. Now, I don't know if Ellen Page is thinking this deeply about it, but the thing is she hit the nail on the head in this one. She perfectly summarized and gave a case study in a very short amount of time, to her credit, of really what is at the core of not only the trans movement, but this entire postmodernist thought process, whether it's being gay or just believing that all morality is subjective and everything's up in the air and truth is just kind of based on whatever you think is right. She really hit the nail on the head with all of it, I think inadvertently, because even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. She perfectly summarized that what is at the core of all this is self-love. The idea that you are your own God, and the more that I love myself and embrace myself, that's what she says at the end of this right here. It's like, the more I love myself, the more I can dream, and the more I can thrive. Again, because it's all based on feelings. There is no such thing as a moral objectivity that exists outside of me. Ergo, the more I love myself, because I am my own God, 
the better that I am. You see, the thinking in Western civilization for the vast majority of our history, at least since the onset of Christendom, was that, you know, whether or not it's good or not to love yourself, what's really more important is to seek God's favor, to do what God wants you to do and to live up to his standard because he is the moral measure. I mean, that, that's what we're taught by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, is that with the same measure that you judge, you shall also be judged, and that the Bible is what is going to act as the mirror, which comes from the epistles, that we are going to use to gauge ourselves, and a man should every single Sunday when, when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, Jesus instructs us to let a man examine himself. We're supposed to be constantly under the... We should be in the mode of self-reflection in order to better ourselves and bring ourselves more closely in line with what God wants us to be. The church of self-love just throws all that out, and you are the center of the universe. You get to make your own decisions about what is right is what is wrong, and you get to speak your truth and just be authentic to yourself. See, Jesus says the opposite. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. It's not about you. And it amazes me that somehow people view this as compassionate and just. Because the whole idea of compassion and justice and moral goodness, just those concepts, would mean what? That there is some force outside of you making those decisions. Because if it's all just what you want to do, then how can you call that good? Maybe I want to kill somebody. How is that bad? If I am my own moral arbiter, then isn't maybe I was just born a murderer and killing people is tr being true to myself. See, they don't have a good answer for that and why that would be bad because you cannot justify that if you're living in a morally ambiguous world. And this is the problem with everything that the left has been preaching for the past couple of decades is that if you throw out all objectivity, the only thing you're left with is each person doing what they think is best in their own mind. And you wind up with people like Ellen Page that can literally say, I am a man and that is a good thing. And this last little bit, which is just a... a just a self-gratifying pat on the back to herself for being so authentic... That's really where this whole thing culminates, that I get to be my own God and I get to make my own morality. That's why I think the gay pride thing is so appropriate, because it is pride. It is the idea that, well, God doesn't get to decide my gender, I get to decide my gender. God doesn't get to decide who I should and should not be attracted to, I get to decide all of those things. And so ultimately, that's what you wind up with, a world of utter chaos where nothing makes sense. Hey, if you liked this video, then you should press the like button. I mean, that's literally what it's there for. If you liked the video but didn't hit the like button, then it's like getting great service but not tipping your waiter. Except liking is free, and so is subscribing and hitting the notification bell. So if you're enjoying my content but not liking my video, there's really only one explanation. It's because I'm black, isn't it?